Hi, and welcome to Smart Training 365. This is Mo Larby, and I'm with Doug Brignoli today. How are you doing, Doug? Hey, Mo, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Today, we have a special guest. Before I introduce him, I wanna show you this video first. Yeah, I want to um, just kind of chime in, especially on the accessory work. I think what, what I have seen, you know, uh, I've been involved with powerlifting since 2006, and uh, it seems there are things come and come and go, and things come in waves. The pendulum swings back and forth. Uh, the, the specificity is really important. You need to practice the competition lifts if you want to compete. Those are really the only mandatory exercises. But that being said, uh, building the, the sum of the whole is going to be the sum of its parts. So if I can get all these individual muscles stronger, uh, you know, Larry and Otis are going to be healthier and stronger when we kind of build up the foundation here. And some of those accessory movements, they're going to be able to take those things, uh, not only into their powerlifting training, but if he wants to do some personal work, do some bodybuilding goals. Uh, you know, Otis is kind of coming back from an injury. So you, when you're picking accessory movements, you want to do things that line up really well with your joints, cause minimal stress, so you get maximum benefit. So, even if you're not a powerlifting competitor, those things can be really helpful to build up your overall physique and strength. So uh, we hope that you guys enjoy that. Give those, give those a try and let us know what you think in the, in the comments below. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have John with us today. How you doing, John? How's it going, Mo and, and Doug? It's a pleasure to, uh, to be on this call with you. Um, I've been really diving into all your content. I've probably watch 99% of your videos and always uh, tune in with, with your new stuff. So I'm just really happy to be here and just excited to uh, chat. With, I think conversations like this are really going to help us move forward. It's not just kind of this back and forth. Uh, it's a live conversation that's ongoing and that's going to really take our industry to the next level. So really happy to be here. I'm happy to have you with us, John. Yeah, I'm honestly um, uh, very impressed with how open-minded you are because usually people like... Uh, let's say it like power lifters usually don't really talk about isolation movement and stuff uh so uh let's start off by uh, introducing yourself to our viewers so they know what you do sure i'll try to keep it short and sweet uh but i'm john gaglione i'm founder of gaglione strength uh, founded in 2011 it's my company we have a gym in long island new york um i've been competing and involved with coaching uh, since 2006 um started competing as in the powerlifting uh, world and uh, as a 198 lifter, I've competed in six different weight classes all the way to super heavyweight. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm the first and only man to squat 800 pounds in six different weight classes. So that's kind of my uh, iron cred, if you will. Uh, I did my first bodybuilding show last year, which I'm really excited to pursue that a little bit more. It's um, weight loss is something that's been really challenging for me over the years. So I'm really proud of that. Um, and in terms of my coaching prowess and things like that, I've coached all time record holders. We've, and, uh, at the time of this recording, uh, we've helped over 80 lifters, uh, over the years, uh, become nationally ranked. So that's top 50 in their weight class and division, uh, nationally. So I'm really proud of that. So we've had a lot of good results over the years. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just looking forward to kind of keeping people stronger and healthier for many years to come. I love powerlifting. I love lifting heavy but I do understand there's a cost to it. So I want to do it in like the smartest way possible. Cause I do love competing. Uh, I was a former high school wrestler and football player. So this is kind of like keeps my, my competitive fire and juices going. So I want to do this for a long time. So thanks for having me. You're welcome. So John, why you love powerlifting? <laughs> oh man. Uh, good question, this is, right? <laughs> this is a really good question. Um, well, you know, so I, I was a, fa a failed athlete. Um, that's why I started coaching. Um, I actually, uh, I tore my hamstring, my first uh, football practice, my senior year, and it was not due to lack of effort. It just, I don't believe I was training optimally. I was training very hard, but not very smart. Uh, I didn't really understand nutrition. I didn't really understand any of the stuff that we're going to talk about today in terms of mechanics. We didn't really learn form. <laughs> we didn't learn. There was no like, there was no technique conversation. It was just, can you put more weight on the bar? Um, and I think there's some value to progressive overload, but not at the expense of technique and understanding like what's the purpose of this and what, what, what is kind of the end goal and what's the, the cost and the benefit. I didn't understand those things. 
So anyways, uh, I wrestled my senior year on one leg because I wanted to come back. I, my hamstring never healed. My goal was to be an all-county wrestler. I lost in double overtime uh, to, in the round to place in the counties, and that was my goal. So if I had trained a little bit better, a little smarter, if I was a little healthier, I would have achieved my goal easily. And that drove me insane. But that darkness, through that darkness, uh, it drove me to learn. It drove me to become a coach. I never wanted any athlete to go through what I went through. And knock on wood, I've never had any catastrophic injuries powerlifting since then. My worst injuries were as a high school wrestler and football player. I still have made many mistakes, but um, and I've had some dings and stuff, but nothing major. No, like I've had my worst injuries were actually in high school. Um, so anyways, over the years, um, I just decided that I was not kind of quote unquote good enough to wrestle in, high, in college. So I decided at 18 years old, uh, my, my high school wrestling coach was a power lifter and um, my uh, middle school wrestling coach was a power lifter. And I just, I always loved training. Um, I found that training was the one place I was in control. I felt like the harder I worked, I got a result. And that was a really, really cool feeling. I felt proud of myself and I felt like I was very in control. Uh, whereas other th areas in my life were maybe not as much in control. I felt like what I could do in the weight room was very much the harder I worked. I got some, I got a benefit. I saw a benefit. I saw the weight on the bar go up. Uh, but I knew I wanted to learn like more. So I started to visit, I visited Westside Barbell. I started visiting all these coaches, Mike Boyle and Eric Cressy. Mark Westside. Bell, right? Westside, uh, and, Mark and, Bell. And Mark, and Mark Bell was one. I was, at, I was actually at Mark Bell's first seminar. He could not. They were going to cancel it. He could not sell enough tickets, which is so funny. Now this was over like 10 years ago. They couldn't give it away, but I, but I got, I had dinner with him one-on-one uh, -on -one and I had a great, you know, we, you know, we've been kind of in contact and friends ever since. And so this is really funny how things happen, but um, you know um, I was always interested in learning um, and I always used myself as a Guinea pig first, but the more I learned, we had high school wrestlers, uh, started getting stronger. They started placing in the States and the County. So they, these athletes that I was working with, they were able to achieve what, what I couldn't. And that was really cool. And then a lot of these high school wrestlers started to graduate and they wanted just like me, they wanted something to train for. I was like, well, why don't you train for this powerlifting meet? It's something you can be say competitive. You have a goal. And I always felt it gave me a purpose. I, I always felt like training without a goal is kind of like getting in your car and driving without a destination. It's, it's really important to have a goal. I'm very, adamant about that and it's always helped me so training for a meet allowed me to have purpose to my training and gave me and i really haven't taken much time off from the gym uh, i love it it's my therapy uh it gives me a positive focus and it's really helped me stay grounded um so that's the <laughs> the short version i can go on and on but i love lifting i love what it's done for me from a confidence standpoint uh but at the end of the day it just keeps my competitive fire going and it gives me a purpose I think it's really important to have purpose when you're in the gym and really purpose for anything you do. You want to, everything that you do, uh, you want to make sure there's a reason behind it. Mm -hmm. Doug, is that what you felt when you first started bodybuilding? Like before you know this knowledge, what drove you to start bodybuilding? Well, I think, I think the common thread, um, you know, between John and me and, and I'll, any, anyone who starts pursuing a particular sport, um, we just want to feel good about ourselves. We want to feel, you know, adequate. We want to feel strong. We want to feel um, respected, respectable. Um, and um, I was really skinny. You know, my goal was just to get, quote unquote, normal. My goal wasn't to become a bodybuilder. My goal wasn't to compete. My goal was just simply to look not skinny, to look normal. Um, and, and once I started, I started enjoying it so much. I started, you know, having so much fun with it and getting, getting, you know, pretty good response right away. Um, and it just, you know, motivated me to continue, which of course, and I tell people now motivation, you know, is a, is a cost benefit thing, right? So, uh, I was fortunate enough to have the genetics that allowed me to get enough, uh, gains, enough benefit to cause this cost benefit thing to, you know, tip in the way where the cost didn't seem so great and the benefit, the reward seemed, you know, significantly worth it. Um, some people don't have good genetics. Some people aren't rewarded as well for their investment. And some people perceive the exercise as more costly, psychologically costly than someone like me might feel. But I was lucky and I, and I just, uh, you know, it, it fed into itself. And I just uh, felt that, you know, it was a good self-esteem thing to be as best 
athletically as I could be. And Doug, when you first started, you were introduced more to compound movement or isolation? Um, I was introduced to, when I started bodybuilding, I, when I, my very first introduction to weight training was having bought one of those plastic cement filled barbell dumbbell sets. And so it came with a pamphlet, it came with a, a book. And so it had all the quote bodybuilding exercises, curls, tricep extensions, dumbbell uh, press, one arm dumbbell rows, things like that. Um, and yes, of course, it included, you know, squat, barbell squats and things like that. Um, but I was also reading the, the magazines. I was reading Iron Man magazine and Muscular Development magazine. And, you know, you would always hear people saying that you need to do the compound lifts as a foundation. So mm -hmm. I was exposed to that and I was, and I experimented with it, you know, and I, and I, but I've always been very analytical and very aware of how things feel and whether they feel right. Like I remember the very first time I did parallel bar dips, you know, the book said it's supposed to be for pecs and triceps. And I, and I said at, at 14 years old, I said, I'm feeling this in my front deltoids. I mean, I didn't know it was a front deltoid. I said, I'm feeling it right here. Right. And then same thing with upright rows. I was doing upright rows and I thought, you know, really are my wrists supposed to be bent this way? I mean, that's really uncomfortable. And where does the thing end? I mean, you know where a curl ends, you know where a tricep extension ends, but you're doing this upright row and there's no like obvious conclusion. So yeah, that, that was the beginning of me saying to myself, you know, you want me to do these, these compound movements, but they don't feel as good. They just don't feel as gratifying to me. Mm. John, what are the big lifts? Like, uh, tell us one day of your, like about, uh, let's say one day of your training routine. Uh, like currently or so. I'll when you first, I'll, yeah. Oh, when I first started? Yes. Yeah. So um, when I was in high school, uh, we did um, box squats, touch and go bench press, which turned into bounce off the chest <laughs> bench mm -hmm. press. Uh, we did trap bar deadlifts. And uh, then we would do like a, usually like a standing overhead press or something like that. Um, and then from there, those were kind of our main lifts. So we, I would train four days a week, which I thought was quite a bit for a high school kid. Like I was pretty dedicated. Um, and we usually kind of trained like every other day. So maybe like Sunday, uh, maybe like Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, something like that. And we would just do like an upper lower split. Um, we might do some kind of, you know, power stuff to kind of, you know, box jumps and things like that for athletics. And then we would kind of do a little bit more. Um, we might do like, you know, lunges for like lower body assistance and ab work and, uh, you know, uh, the reverse hypers and, and things like that, which that was one, uh, to your point, Doug, uh, I love Louis Simmons stuff. I love the West side barbell for a lot of things, but that thing I felt no benefit for. <laughs> and that's like, what I, I knew right when I was younger, right away, that that was one that I kind of scrapped very quickly. Um, which is interesting that you say that. Cause that's like, that's like the, I love a lot of stuff that Louis Simmons teaches. And that's like one I'm like, listen, I love Louis Simmons, but I think it's kind of like a worth, I sold my reverse hyper like years ago. I haven't, you know, haven't felt the need to use it. Um, but that we did reverse hypers and kind of weighted sit-ups and things like that. And for, and for, uh, for upper body, we would do like push-ups and pull-ups, uh, bent over rows, one arm rows, um, you know, and then, you know, we, sometimes we do some arm work to feel good, but I will, even at, at a young age and at, my arms are kind of a weak point. Uh, I never really did a lot of curls because that wasn't functional. Right. Um, and I, it's it kind of, I feel like it was considered cosmetic. Yeah. But and so like for me, like, and, and we, we were always drilled, like the squat, the squat, it's the king of the lifts. So that was like, and lo and behold, what's my best lift. But that was drilled into my head, like early on. Yeah. The squat is like, that's when you know you're strong. And that was, and you know, I like, you know, my first competition as a teenager, I squatted 375. Um, as a teenager, I ended up squatting 446. Uh, it was a WNPF, uh, you know, world record you know at the time it was a federation record i did a 446 squat at 198 pounds at uh, 19 years old and i was damn proud of that and you know it meant uh you know it was like but like again that was drilled into me that like the squat is so important so that was kind of like a typical split um you know and things have evolved so much and i've tried like many different i've tried like you know doing no isolation movements i've tried so many different things in terms of uh training but that was kind of like my start um, and I still kind of like that kind of, I do kind of like, you know, splitting up upper body and lower body. Um, and I've kind of spread out my training over time. And depending on if I have a little bit more of a powerlifting or bodybuilding focus now, um, you know, things have evolved, but that was kind of like the start of my training and it's changed so much 
uh, since then, but that was what it looks like. Mm -hmm. how, how did you train for, let's say, the squat? How did you train for the deadlift? How did you train for the bench press? Sure. So it depends on uh, what what part of my career we're talking. But um, I was again. I mentioned before. I was before you met you. You learned about Doug's book. Yeah. So I, I was very he heavily influenced by Louis Simmons. So um, if you're familiar, if any of the listeners are, are familiar with Westside Barbell, uh, and they call it like conjugate style training, uh, which is essentially like you know the idea is that you you work on multiple qualities at the same time. So you work on developing maximal strength and as well as maybe some sort of speed or power. And then maybe so, so the, the thought is that you lift heavy weights to get strong. You lift light weights explosively to get, ex, to get fast and explosive. And then you would do like high repetitions to kind of build muscle mass and muscle endurance. That was kind of the thought. And that's essentially the, the dumbed down version of like West side barbell style training. So uh, we would have a, a day that was dedicated toward heavy squatting and heavy deadlifting a day that was dedicated toward heavy benching. And then two days, that were dedicated more towards building the skill of the lift. We would use submaximal weights uh, and work on working on timing and explosion. And oftentimes we would use things like we call accommodating resistance bands and chains. And you know, not to get off topic, but those things make things late phase loaded, which is <laughs> a whole other. But which I do think there's some benefit to for the sport of powerlifting. But I do understand. I was like, huh. Um, anyways, that, that was kind of an aha moment because everything we, we kind of learned with West side barbell is we want to accommodate the strength curve and we want more resistance at the top because the moment arm decreases. So I thought that was, that was something that I've had. I, I still am thinking a lot about, um, as we speak, but, um, but essentially we would do like a, we would usually do one to two barbell lifts, a workout. And one thing I will credit Louie, and I think he always preached the importance of assistance work. If you look at a lot of his work, he says, 80% uh, of their training is from special exercises. So non-competition lifts. So I think, which is very, it's not popular and it's very much against the grain, but I do think if he preaches one thing, he preaches the importance of accessory work. Um, now the question is, which movements do you pick for those accessory right. movements? So that's because I think that's where you're going to get, get the most bang for your buck. And you could be spinning your wheels and wasting time if you're not picking the right exercises and using the right form and the appropriate load, et cetera. Um, but essentially when we do max effort training, we would just work up to like either a heavy triple, double or single. So we're just working on the ability to strain. And then we would do some, if we do back offsets, we might, so if I did, let's say we did a, a squat with chains or something like that, we work up to a heavy single and then maybe take the chains off and then maybe do some sets of five or something for pause squats. And then you would do like three to five accessory movements based off your weak points. And that's a whole other thing is like, how do you identify your weak points? that could be a challenge too. So unless you understand biomechanics and where you fail and how like, that's where some of this knowledge can come into play. Cause otherwise, if you don't, how can you identify your weak points? If you don't know what muscles do, what joint actions and where the resistance is. So right. that is something that's, that takes a careful eye to figure out. And is it a, is it a motor learning thing or is it a muscular thing? Because that's, a, that's a whole, cause it, it could just be like a neurological thing that they're not getting. And maybe it's not, maybe they have the strength to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's where I think it takes a good coach to figure that out. Um, and then in terms of the speed day, we would do a uh, sub maximal training. So we might do anywhere from like nine to 12 sets of one to three reps, but we might only use like 60 or 50% of our max. And we try to move it as fast as humanly possible with good forms. So we work on form and force production. Essentially that's really just a technique day. It's a skill day. Uh, We're trying to get the timing down because there is, um, and depending on how you compete in powerlifting, um, you know, if you use knee wraps and things like that and squat suits and bench shirts, there's a different timing of it. There's a different strength curve. Um, so you have to get familiar with the skill and that's where like the timing and the cadence of the lift, how fast you lower it um, in competition, you need to pause on your chest. So like timing the pause, practicing commands. Right. Um, and then, um, you know, now I'm doing, I'm doing a lot less. I still kind of do a similar thing, but I usually, I just have one day that's dedicated to squatting, one day that's dedicated towards deadlifting, one day that's dedicated toward bench mm. pressing. And then I have like a whole like kind of accessory day. I've kind of, um, I'm spending more time just, I'm spending a lot more of my time and resources now on more, more accessory work, which a lot of those things include a lot of the, the Brig 20, as well as some things that I found are just a little bit maybe more specific to um, some of the muscles and the demands of powerlifting itself, itself, because there are some considerations for that. There are considerations for mm -hmm. being able to, being able to support like three or four times body weight of your, uh, on a barbell on your back. Uh, there's some different demands, uh, than like, you know, someone who's just looking to get generally fit. Um, right. 
but uh, that's kind of like how I lay out my training and how and it's evolved over the years. But essentially, like I do like an upper mm-hmm. lower split um, when I'm training for powerlifting and then we would get more specific. So I would do something that's more closely related to the contest lift as the, the meat gets closer. So that would be more of a traditional barbell squat with competition equipment, with competition standards. If I'm further away from the meat, I might do more things that are a little bit, uh, you know, not as specific, but I like to do exercises in the early phase of training that will force you to use less load, but you still get a high muscular stimulus. So I might do like something like a pause squat or a safety, a harder variation. So it limits the amount of load I have to use to still, but I still learn to strain. So that's kind of a technique that I've played with. Uh, but as I get closer to the competition, I want to kind of see where I'm at. So I'll do things that are, are more closely related to the contest lift under contest conditions. Um, if that makes sense. So that's yeah. like kind of my thought, but I've always, kind of, I've always kind of been mindful of like, can I get like less, uh, can I use less weight and still get a great benefit? Can I get a great stimulus from using mm-hmm. less load? Um, that's, that's something that I'm always thinking about, but obviously there's, there comes to a point in time where you have to like, you got to practice the event and you got to see, you got to see where you're at. So that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's what I wanted to ask you, Doug, like, when did you realize that, okay, now I tried these big lifts and when did you find out like, okay, I need to figure out a way how to load the muscle more efficiently and get more of a muscle growth and strength. What triggered that? Let me, let me just, before I answer that question, let me just say something in regard to what John said earlier in that video with Larry. He said, the whole is the sum of the parts, right? So, and that's exactly correct, right? So you're doing a compound movement and there's several muscles that are participating in that compound movement. Each of those muscles being stronger will help the compound movement, right? So as an example, let's just say, and as we've talked about it before, And you can quantify the amount of load, let's say, that's on a tricep when you're doing parallel bar dips. So let's say you, you weigh 180 pounds and that's two arms, 90 pounds per arm. And you're going to dip down and you're, you're doing this for tricep development. But because your tricep lever, which is your forearm, is only going 11% from the neutral position, you're only getting 11% of the available load. So let's see what the available load is. You say 90 pounds times the magnifier, which is the length of the forearm, it's a 12 to 1 ratio, times 11%, you end up with 119 pounds of load per tricep, which you might think that's a lot. But then if you go lie down on a flat bench with a pair of 20 pound dumbbells, because your forearm gets horizontal, it's 20 times 12 times 100%, not 11%, and you end up with 240 pounds of load per tricep. Well, 240 pounds of load is going to make that tricep stronger than 119 pounds of load during parallel bar dips. But when you're doing parallel bar dips, it feels harder. In other words, if you tried to get 240 pounds of load on your triceps by doing parallel bar dips and just adding weight, you'd never get there. You'd never get there. You'd have to use twice your body weight in order to double the load on the tricep. And by then you'd probably blow out your front deltoid. So If you want to strengthen your tricep for a bench press, you're better off doing something like this, an isolated tricep exercise, because you're never going to be able to load that tricep uh, as much as well, unless you isolate it. So that's, that's why I say, you know, the brick 20, even though they are essentially isolation exercises, that doesn't mean that you can't incorporate them in powerlifting training or football training or anything. Um, and getting back to this issue of the whole is, is, is the sum of the parts. Um, you know, it needs to be established that when you say, I want to, I want to have a strong body, I want to be strong. And that's why I power lift. I would say, well, just like I did on parallel bar dips, you can actually measure, you can quantify how much load each muscle is getting during a power lift. And you might be surprised to find that it's getting much less than it would get during an isolation exercise. So if you do all isolation exercises and you strengthen all the individual muscle groups to the point that they're just as strong or stronger than the guy who's not doing isolation exercises, but just doing the power lifts, you are strong. All of your components are strong. They can all be measured individually and they're stronger, far stronger than they were before. 
And if you measured them against the, the isolated strength of muscles that were developed by a guy doing only compound lifts, you would discover that his individual muscle strength is actually more than his individual muscle strength. But when you power lift, you use a, a variety of muscles at one time and you use a, a system of physics You're using the physics that minimizes the amount, the percentage of load that each individual muscle is getting. In other words, I always tell people, why do you think it's so hard to do a sissy squat even when you can do a 300 pound barbell squat? Because the physics are different, right? So the physics makes the squat easier as compared to the physics that makes a squat, a sissy squat harder, right? So um, it, it's important to understand that, that some of the gratification that people get from a power lift comes from the number, the amount of total amount weight lifted as it compares to other people doing that same lift. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're stronger than the guy who's not doing that lift, but works each muscle as hard and heavy as he can work each muscle. It's just that it's, it's a way of standardizing the measure. And so I, I, I think it's important to understand two things. One is that you can use isolation exercises to improve a power lift because you can improve the strength of each individual muscle. And separately, you can strengthen each individual muscle and not use a standardized measuring tool like a, a squat or a bench press um, because maybe you don't care how that amount compares to other people's amount. Maybe you're not competing or maybe you're just not into that, but you realize that isolation exercises are not only cosmetic because anytime you load a muscle, the muscle is going to respond by getting stronger. It has to, it has to adapt to this load. It does that by getting stronger. So, so the idea that, that, that strength training um, should only be thought of as compound movements. That's wrong. You strength train anytime you challenge a muscle with resistance. That's strength training. You measure it in a standardized way with a compound lift or a power lift. You, you're measuring it. You're, you're doing it in a way that allows you to kind of compare it to other people. But that doesn't mean that that method of training, that compound exercise, developed more strength than what you'd get with isolated, isolated exercises. I mean, load is load. Muscle growth and muscle strengthening all relies on muscle load. So now, uh, Doug, uh, back to the question, because I'm trying to understand like if there is benefit, let's say if there is benefit in powerlifting for a bodybuilder, or if there is a benefit of bodybuilding exercises in powerlifting. So how, how what made you change and think about a better way to do to load the muscle? Well, the first thing I'll say is the short answer to your question is there's definitely benefit to using bodybuilding exercises. Well, typical bodybuilding exercises. You know, we obviously par that Talking down to, to even the best ones, right? Brick 20. But there is benefit to using isolation exercises for powerlifting. Is there benefit to use powerlifting exercises? for bodybuilding? And the answer is no. The answer is no, because everything you can get from a power lift, from a compound lift, you can get better with an isolation lift. That's just without question. And, and it is, this is just a matter of engineering, just a matter of physics. I mean, you know, one of the people that we're going to be interviewing for our video is structural engineers. And just like I compared parallel bar dip tricep load with skull crusher tricep load, this is an absolute figure. 240 pounds of tricep load is positively more better than 119 pounds of tricep load, right? So if you're going to try to compare and say, well, isn't there a tricep benefit to a bodybuilder and doing parallel bar dips? And I would say, well, why is 119 pounds better than 240 pounds? It's not. It's just not. 240 pounds is better if your objective is tricep load, tricep strengthening, tricep growth. So the difference is that, and, and, and now we can get into a little bit of philosophy here, you know, and, 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 and everyone has the freedom to, you know, pick the thing that turns them on the most. 